I'm with a man who has so little to say, but says it very well, <laughs> my friend Boone Pickens. Uh, we've been backstage talking football, but we're out here to talk about the state of the country and to talk at the beginning about his field of expertise, one of many, the energy situation in America. Uh, it was not that long ago that you were appearing when I was running on Meet, I was running Meet the Press after Tim died for that period of time. You were in the thick of wind is the answer at that point. What happened? Lost my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, uh, the wind, I mean, you know, of course, all energy has a cost. Right. And wind, too, has a cost, but it's, co it's priced off the margin. And the marginal fuel is priced off of is natural gas. And when I thought I was going to get rich off of wind, uh, natural gas was seven dollars, and that well, anything over six makes wind good. But today, wind went from seven up to twelve, and I didn't hedge it. <laughs> okay, laugh, goddamn near busted me. You should have called me. I would have known. I would have said. And that. but I kept thinking it was going to go higher. Didn't hedge it. It went down and went clear down to a dollar, and so it never has been above three dollars. So wind struggles at, uh, with natural gas at $3. And at the same time, you were deeply involved with wind and talking about it. You were kind of messianic about it. A couple of your fellow Texans, a couple of good old boys, were developing something called fracking. They were kind of, kind of getting going on that. And no one kind of saw that coming to the degree that it has arrived in America. But you know the first frack job I saw? was at Border, Texas in 1952. I was one year out of college. Now, it did, <laughs> it went way beyond that 1952, but fracking's been around forever. But the degree to which the new techniques work, that was unanticipated, right? The well, depth to which they could go and the effectiveness with which- Well, it was a horizontal drilling. Right. Because you go vertical, uh, whatever depth, and then you go horizontal, and the further out horizontal you go, it opens up more zone to frack. And now, I mean, you're you're uh, you actually put sand in wells to the level at I mean, like 20 car loads, train car loads of sand go down one well and are fracked. I was with some fracking uh, hedge fund people recently, and. One of their, uh, I suppose, most outspoken advocates said, people don't care about the environment anymore. They don't care about what happens with the water coming out of the fracking issues. They only want to get cheap gas and get to where they want to go. We had a pretty spirited argument. I think fracking is a genius idea, and I do think it's a big part of where we're going to get to. But there are problems to solve. And the fracking industry, it seems to me, has got to step up on some of those problems. Wait a minute, what are the problems? Do you, you think they'll get there? Get where? In terms of dealing with the water that is coming out of those wells and the groundwater contamination that comes with fracking in, in many instances. No, Tom, you can't give me one place there's been a groundwater problem with fracking. Not one place. Now you're gonna frack, you got, you, you, you'll frack those wells and you'll pump 100,000 barrels down them. 100,000 barrels of water. And that is slick water, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's clean going in. What does it come out? It comes out, it'll be salty and all, but it's, it's easy to manage. There's no problem there. You can retreat the water and use it again. Well, I don't doubt that they're gonna solve it because there, there's a kind of genius about fracking, and the, you know, the technology is constantly moving. But what was striking to me was and this was not a minor figure uh, saying people don't care about that anymore. And I think part of the issue going forward is how do you balance? But they don't care about it because it's not a problem. We don't, we don't have any problems with fracking. Now, if you saw the other day, there was a pretty good sized earthquake in Oklahoma. And they would like to tie that to fracking. That's not fracking. What that is, is a disposal back down, they're getting rid of the fluid, put it back down and put it in the Arbuckle. Well, that's a formation just above the basement rock. 
and the, it takes water very easily. So it's a, it's a natural if it, okay, just saying, I'm gonna make my point. But what happens, they filled up the Arbuckle, then they broke down into the basement. Now, when you put the water down there, you can cause movement and you can have an earthquake. And they shut the, that disposal. That's the problem, not the fracking. Uh, are we good to go for a long time in terms of energy independence because of fracking and all the new techniques that are being developed? We've got more natural gas than any place else in the world. We have plenty of oil. We have produced 50 billion barrels of oil in the Permian Basin, and we've produced 50 billion barrels of oil out of the Gulf of Mexico. The Permian Basin has at least 100 billion left because of fracking. I read the other day there was just an enormous field developed in West Texas in, right. in the fracking industry. It, it's a horizontal drilling that did it. The fracking is secondary but necessary, but the horizontal drilling is what allows us to do that. But the United States can be energy independent if we want to be energy independent. And do you think we want to be energy independent? Do we? Do I think we want to? Yeah. Well, the consumer would rather have cheap gasoline. Uh, Boone, let me ask you about the debate that is going on in this country about the obligation that everybody has about balancing the need for energy and consumer uh, goods and the real fact of global warming and the place of carbon in all of that. Where do you see the intersection of that in terms of a political debate? Do you think it'll ever get resolved? Well, it is a real, a real debate. Right now, energy is so cheap. The United States has the cheapest energy in the world. That's a fact. And I'm surprised that uh, Trump hadn't picked up on that and said, we'll rebuild the economy on the back of cheap energy. That's been a surprise to me. Uh, Clinton's not going to say that because she doesn't like uh, energy and doesn't uh, and all doesn't like energy. Well, she has to have energy. We all know that. But she doesn't like fossil fuels. And there's no replacement for fossil fuels now, so you have to be realistic. You have to use natural gas and oil to solve the problem. But the world today, Tom, uses 95 million barrels of oil every day. And 70% of that goes to transportation fuel. And transportation fuel has to be there. There's nothing to replace it. You can't, there are only two fuels that move an 18-wheeler, natural gas and diesel. No, no uh, uh, battery. Battery doesn't move an 18-wheeler. Do the big fleets see it the same way you do? Well, uh, Fred Smith and I were on last week. He's opened a, a huge terminal in Oklahoma City and uh, his 18 wheelers are all be on natural gas. Yeah, I, I think you're coming, UPS, all their trucks are on natural gas. What do you think the future is for electric cars? You know, this guy is a, a tremendous salesman, <clears throat> that uh, uh, Tesla guy. I would have shorted that stock, thank God I didn't. <clears throat> but I, because uh, the, it's too expensive. Those cars are expensive. Now he says he's gonna get the price down, Listen, whatever he says, I believe him. I think the guy's damn smart. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's more expensive. A battery car is. But you're gonna have better batteries and the cars are gonna get cheaper. It's gonna happen. I don't think there's any doubt about that. When you come to New York City at this time of the year and try to get around on the streets, I mean, I tried to get from East 79th Street today to 43rd and Lexington, I was hemmed in for an hour by large trucks all over the city and one passenger per car, bumper to bumper, all the way up and down the street. But how long have we dealt with that? It is, that's time. not recent. A long time, well, yeah. a long time. I must tell you, however, that I got back not so long ago from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I was down there for the Olympics and all the horror stories that we heard about uh, Rio de Janeiro, it, the city itself were not true, the economy, is beyond 
being in the toilet at this point. I mean, the average wage in Rio is $400 a month. The average one-bedroom apartment is $325 to rent. So you got $75 just for whimsy for, for the rest of the month. But the streets worked. Uh, mass transit was working. I come home to the greatest city in the world, New York, and it is a nightmare. Why is there no more urgency about, in this country especially, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, about doing something about making our transportation more efficient in every way about how many people are in each vehicle and how swiftly they move. That's a question for me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how in the hell you might make it more efficient. I mean, we, you know, New York is New York. You come here, you know what you're gonna have when you get here. It's crowded, but everybody loves it. I wouldn't want to live here. But I don't know how you make it more efficient than it is. It isn't the fuel. That's not the problem. No. It's you've got too many trucks, too many cars. And I've got a grandson up here who works for Barclays. And he doesn't own a car. Can you imagine a guy out of college who doesn't own a car? No, I have a granddaughter, same thing, at Columbia. You know, and she's a whiz when it comes to mass transit in the city but mass transit can only handle so much. And at some point, if today is not just necessarily an exception, at some point, it is, I think, gonna have a deleterious effect on the appeal of the city. I mean, I know it's still the magnet for people all over the world, but other cities in China, they've got high-speed trains and things work in a way that we don't work here. Is the city so constructed upon, on top of itself that there's not room for that kind of innovative uh, change. Well, a high-speed train, uh, you know, it's got to, it's got to go somewhere. Yeah. This is pretty damn uh, confined here. You wouldn't get up to very much speed before you'd have to stop. And uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know what you do for it. But gosh, at my age, Tom, I don't have to worry about those guys. <laughs> Hell, I, I've got things to do, but. All the things I have to do have to happen quick. So you can, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Boone, uh, let me talk about your life at, at this stage in your life. What is it that you're still looking forward to? What gets you up in the morning? Every day, every day gets me up. Every day I have to look forward to. I love to work. And people say to me, well, Boone, you're 88 years old. You know, you really should retire. Well, hell with you. I'm not going <laughs> to retire, but I said, I'd have to find another group of people to associate with. Well, I am associated with the best people, smartest people that you can imagine. And it, but to associate with them, I have to be productive. Or, you know, they're liable to tell me to retire. And so, I, you know, I think I'm retiring. You know Bill Snyder. Uh, football coach, Kansas State. Right. He's 10 years younger than me. And we watched a football game together four or five years ago. And he said, I wanted to sit with you today because I maybe have made a mistake. And I said, you retired. And he said, that's right. I retired. I'm retired now. And I don't know why in the hell I did it. And I said, you can't find people that you want to be with, that are productive like you are, and you were still a factor in football coaching and you left early. As long as you're productive, you can carry your, your way in the crowd you're associated with. Well, I don't see any reason to, to uh, retire. But have you changed the pace of your life? I mean, you're still in pursuit of those things that interest you, that get you up in the morning. But are you doing it in the same way you did 20 years out of Oklahoma State as opposed to now. 20 years out of Oklahoma State, I was broke. <laughs> I but that's a big, being broke I, is a big incentive as well. Damn right it is. I've been broke several times. But, but, the, but I, I have a trainer that shows up at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, they, he's there whether I want him or not. There's a big debate going on right now, even as we sit here, about the future of this country, about long term and short term. We're in the midst of maybe the most chaotic presidential campaign I have ever covered, and I've been doing it for 50 years. What's your feeling about the future of America? 
it's, it scares the hell out of you. Uh, I mean, uh, th this is the strangest two candidates I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you have one every day, every day they uncovered another set of lies. And you have the other one, that peculiar uh, guy <laughs> had, had passed. Let me tell you, I didn't think he would ever get off the ground when he announced, I, I really didn't think he was serious that he was running for president. That's how, but he came in there but he came in at a time that is, seems to be perfect for his skills. And that is the country's fed up with what we have. Don't you think? Oh, I think that the, I mean, he, he wins all the polls in terms of an agent of change. I think the country is very fed up, frankly. They've given up on the federal government and it's, it is a separate island from where the rest of the country is. I live in three different places. I live here in New York. I also have a ranch in Montana. I've been out there for 30 years. I grew up in South Dakota, so I know that world as well and how they feel about it. They have never felt more distant from the federal government and the nation's capital than they do right now. On the other hand, in New York, and my friends who are here, they have no connection to the people who live out there. They don't get it. <laughs> so my- Now wait a minute, who doesn't get it? Well, both sides don't get it. I mean, I have a friend in Montana I'll not tell you who he is, very conservative, very successful businessman. And I, he said, everything has gone to hell. And I said, well, st starting with what? And he said, white heterosexual males no longer have anything to say in America. I said, have you checked the CEO's office of every major bank, of every major energy company, <laughs> of every major communication company? White heterosexual males are still got their hands on the power of the lever. In New York, my friends will say to me, I don't get the West. Well, why don't they like regulation? <laughs> I said, because you're not running cattle or you're not worrying about where the water is on your apartment. Out there, every time they turn around, they got a set of federal regs staring them in the face about what they can and cannot do. Okay, Montana, South Dakota, you know it. You were born there and spent a lot of time there. How are they going to vote? Well, those two states are going to go for Trump. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it. I, I don't think that there's a chance that Hillary could win either one of those two states. First of all, they got a strong Republican base in uh, Montana and in South Dakota. John Thune, a very effective senator uh, there. And Montana has got a Democratic governor, but a, it's a conservative culture. Those are not the states that count. This is going to be an election. You still have conservative Democrats out there. Well, of course we do. Yeah, we, and, but we also have... I think this is going to be an election in nine states. It's not going to be a national election. Go, be a, down, go down the nine states. Well, uh, Ohio. He's, Trump's running ahead. North Carolina. Colorado. Trump's ahead. Colorado is in play. Uh, Colorado yeah, is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to some degree, Georgia's in play this time. I don't understand that. Yeah. Well, it's, it has a lot to do with the African-American vote there. And... The, uh, the Florida is obviously in play at this point. Democrats like to think that North Carolina is in play, but it's very hard to see how that plays out. Hard to see, yeah. yeah. And then there are some states like Wisconsin that you know had a longtime Democratic tradition. They got Scott Walker now, but in northern Wisconsin, the dairy industry goes under if the immigrants are sent home. All those hard agricultural they're jobs. Not, they're not going to send any immigrants home. Well, that's the point, but he says they're going to be sent home. And so what happens in the election when Wisconsin goes to the polls, the pro food processing plants in South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, all those turkey plants, all those big meat packing plants, they're all run by illegals. Exactly. And well, you say illegals. There are some illegals, but not all of them. I mean. No, but it is a big part of the work base. And they're well, not all illegal, by the way. In Iowa, you know, in Marshalltown, Iowa, they have uh, casitas and they have, uh, uh, Af I mean, Mexican-American food stores and other things, and they're all legal because they came to do the hard work that uh, young Americans don't want to do anymore. That's right. So are you troubled by the large presence of Hispanic immigrants in this country? They're not all Mexicans. More Mexicans have been going back than have been coming here, by the way, recently. It's Central America now that is sending people here. It's Honduras and Guatemala and that part of South America. How much are you troubled by their presence? I always say troubled by their presence. I, 
in Texas, you wouldn't have any landscape people or bricklayers if it wasn't for them. They have all those jobs and they're good jobs. There's nothing wrong with those jobs. And uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want those people all to go home. I still have rock work being done and I'm not a good rock layer. So I, I, re, I, I need those people. On your ranch, how many Hispanic employees do you have? How many do I have? Hispanic employees. Uh, 21 out of 25. And you have a very airtight process for putting through their legality? Oh yeah, we do that for sure. I'm proud of this point. I have uh, two uh, Mexican guys, they were boys when they came there. They were legal and uh, they came and they now have uh, uh, another brother and a cousin, but I have educated all of their children. And they didn't go, all go to Oklahoma State either. You thought they did, didn't you? But they didn't. They, one went to Texas Tech, one went to the University of Texas, and the rest of them went to Oklahoma State. <laughs> but I've educated 24 of them. Well, my own experience has been, and it's been tough. I went out to Western Colorado a couple of years ago to do a story about the, real, the reality and the myths of immigration. And from Aspen all the way to Rifle, which is going west, mm -hmm. there's a lot of construction. There are highways and new schools and housing developments. The big construction company there has said, without question, our very best employees are all immigrants. And they want to work Sundays, they'll want to work at night, they'll take all the overtime they can get. And they come in with really sophisticated social security cards and other things, but they've all been manufactured. The oh, they're not legal? No, well the construction company will then send them to the federal government. Federal government three months later will say, that's not illegal. And they'll say, but we got three years out of them. I said, you're paying $18 an hour for a hod carrier. You can't go down to rifle and get the high school football team. They said, are you kidding? They only want to play computer games. You know, they, they want to hang out at the bar. They want to socialize. These kids come and they want to learn how to operate everything that we've got going here, whether it's a grader or a bulldozer or a C5 cat, whatever it is, they want to get up there and do it. Let me give you one that uh, I believe that you should bring together uh, Canada, Mexico, and the United States in a North American energy alliance. And it's, I, I think, all makes sense. But I was in Midland, uh, it, not right now because everybody's out of work in Midland right today. But this was back two years ago. And I, I was saying North, North American Energy Alliance, I said, and what one component of that is the United States would provide the technology and the financing to help develop the Canadian oil industry. But we wouldn't let Pemex run it. Okay, that's, that's a state-owned oil company down there. But I said that and Mexico has lots of gas and oil that could be developed. And I would like for the United States to help them do that and do it with uh, banking and everything. And it, it have a real structure to it. And one of the guys in Midland told me, he said, yeah, pick it and say, you do that. And said, all, all of our rig hands will go back to Mexico <laughs> because the rig hands in West Texas are mostly uh, Hispanics, yeah. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. I'm not asking, I'm not saying this just because we've been friends. Uh, but you're an American legend. I mean, you've had what I think of as the uh, prototypical American legend life, especially in your part of the world, um, in Texas and Oklahoma. When you look back on your life, is there a time or a, an event in which you say to yourself, wish I'd gone in that direction, or I wish I'd done that differently? You know, it's interesting because as you get older, you think back, what would have happened if I had gone this way instead of that way? I don't, I know I can't change it. And if things that I can't change, I'm not gonna spend a hell of a lot of time thinking about them. I don't mind spending the evening with you and let's talk about Crossroads and what it might have been if I'd have gone the other way. Uh, that's about all the time I want to spend on it, is an evening. 
Uh, I still have plenty to do, plenty of things I'm interested in. I'm still getting good results. Have I made the mistakes? i would made a hell of a lot of mistakes. But if you're gonna make decisions, some are not gonna be good. And I, yeah, I'd like to go back. I can take you back to uh, 1985 and Phillips Petroleum Company deal. I made a mistake there. We could have taken that company over and we quit before we finished. I wish we had, but I don't think it would have changed my life that much. So I, I, don't, I don't worry about the, the uh, you know, the deals that I maybe, those are, those are just kind of dreams or ideas that if I had gone another direction, I would have been more successful or less successful or whatever. I love it the way it is. My life has been near perfect and, uh, and I've, been, I've enjoyed it. And I just wonder how much more time the Lord's gonna give me, uh, but I'm in a hurry now. On that note, thank you very much. Thank that was great, buddy. That was very good. Thank you.